Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let's stand together and give him praise this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. What a beautiful day that you have again granted for us to be a part of, to awaken this morning and have a beautiful sunrise and these beautiful fall-like skies. And Lord, we just thank you for your blessings upon us with health and freedom and faith and the desire to come and worship you Lord, and to worship you alone here in this place today. Thank you for each person that's here. If we have any guests, Lord, help them not to feel like guests, but to feel like one of us. And Lord, we pray that, God, we can just love on each other and love you more than anyone else and then love our community. And Heavenly Father, we will worship you if we can do all of those things. So God, help us today. Grant, Lord, that we could just lift up the name of Jesus and that lives could be transformed here by all that you do in our lives today through your word. In Jesus' name we give you thanks and amen. And good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to see each and every one of you here today. What a great congregation we have, and it's good to welcome you and especially our guests and and our TV audience, thank you for tuning us in today and radio. And we're so glad to welcome you into our worship service and we'll glad, gladly welcome you to our on-campus worship at any time today. This is our week of prayer for state missions, for Tennessee missions. And it begins today and we have a, one prayer request for today is that all Tennessee Baptists would begin to see the fields that are white and ready for harvest and that we would begin to engage people where we're at, at the marketplace, in the restaurant, the fast food window. Uh, if you are one of those folks that goes through Starbucks or, or Mac Cafe and get you coffee or whatever, talk to them about Jesus, share them, not, not in a condemning way, but tell, tell them what Jesus has done in your life. You can begin there. And just uh, pray that all Tennessee Baptists, what an impact on the state of Tennessee, if all people who call themselves Baptists would begin to see the fields white and ready for harvest. Amen? Also pray about what your part is in our goal for our, our golden mission offering. I'm still calling it that, the offering for 
uh, golden offering for Tennessee Missions. I think they changed it around just a little bit. But our goal for the First Baptist Church is $5,019 here in 2019. And so I know that you will faithfully give, but what is your part? What will God take from you and accept from you and bless from you uh, to help us reach the state of Tennessee? Everything we give to this offering stays in the state of Tennessee. And so let's, let's support our state missionary staff and pray for them and give so that they can do the job that, that God has called them to do. So pray about that. Pray for our sick and recovering. Good to see some of our folks here this morning. Miss Imogene's here, and, and uh, good to welcome some more of you here this morning. Also pray for the Jack Bishop family, and uh, remember to minister to that family tomorrow night, 4 to 7, at Four Oaks Funeral Home. Uh, they'll be receiving friends with the service at 7, so you pray uh, for them and those ministering to them, and lift them up and encourage them and hug them and pray for them, okay? Please do that. Tonight at 6 o'clock, we're having a special service here. If you maintain your position and stay here for the service this morning, uh, you won't have any doubt about what's taking place at 6 o'clock tonight, okay? All right, but I will go ahead and announce it. At 6 o'clock is the Lord's Supper, and when you leave here today, you can choose whether or not you should be here at 6 o'clock tonight, okay? That'll be between you and the Lord. But that's at 6. God bless you. Say, good morning. Good morning. Now turn to the person beside you and say, good morning, I love you. Good morning. Good morning. Amen. Now let's try one more before we start shaking hands, okay? Let's try one more. All right. Let's, let's look to the heavens and from our heart mean it and say, good morning, Lord, I love you. Good morning, Lord, I love you. Let's greet one another. <laughs> Disappointment, strife and discontentment. I'm casting all my care on the Lord. No matter what obsession, faith and depression, I'm standing on the solid ground. I'm standing on the solid ground. 
pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you today to do something that we do every Sunday. But Lord, would you just help us to realize this morning how blessed we are. And that, Lord, we have your hand of protection upon us. Your hand of provision to supply us. And, Lord, your hand of salvation to reach down and give us eternal life. And, Lord, we pray this morning that as we give this offering to you and bring back to you the first portion of all that you have blessed us with, that you would take this tithe and you would take our offering and that you would multiply it, use it for your glory here in our own community and in our country and to the uttermost parts of the earth to preach the gospel that Jesus shared. And Lord, to see souls come to the saving knowledge of Jesus and Lord, to minister to those in devastation, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, in our country and every country of the world. Lord, we are so blessed. Let us give sacrificially so that others may be blessed and especially others may come to know Jesus. For it's in his name that we give with a joyful heart and we worship you. Amen. You may be seated.
y'all will stand with us. We're going to sing another verse of the solid rock. So if you'll stand with us once more, please. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Thank you, and you may be seated. In his book entitled The Gospel According to Jesus, Chris Say shares the following story. He said, one week I was preaching in our church about the kingdom that is coming. And on the way out, a young man grabbed me. And this is what he had to say. Pastor, the kingdom of God is already here. Every Sunday I used to be in this same neighborhood. I used to come down here to a bar called Emo's. And I'd start every night with a drop of ecstasy on the tip of my tongue. And I would wash it down with Bacardi 151. That's what I did Sunday after Sunday. Now I come to a worship service instead. And I finish the evening with the body of Christ on my tongue. And I wash it down giving God thanks for the blood of Christ. This is the kingdom of God. Chris Say adds to that story. He said, this man is experiencing the kingdom. He lives in its presence. He said, we may not recognize it. We often don't see it, but it is right here. And we long to get past the mundane existence of religion and get a taste of the kingdom. You know, when things are done in the church over and over and over again, and there's no ongoing explanation of why they are done, they often just become part of this mundane religious ritual. We do one thing at First Baptist that potentially falls into this category, and that one thing is the Lord's Supper. Many people view this service as insignificant. And as a result, it's usually not very well attended. However, the Lord's Supper offers each one of us the opportunity for transformed lives. Theologically, the Lord's Supper is a symbolic act of obedience whereby members of the church memorialize the death of the Redeemer and anticipate His second coming. It is wonderful to understand this theology of this good ritual practice at First Baptist five to six times a year. But what we miss sometimes is the realization that when properly done, properly approached, the Lord's Supper provides us with the opportunity for spiritual transformation in our life. Why we do it is a simple thing to understand. Jesus taught us to teach new Christ followers to obey all his commandments. Look with me at the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, and we often emphasize the first part as we should therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Spirit, and look at verse 20, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you today to thank you for your word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have blessed us with your word. 
And Lord, we have been so blessed to be a part of the worship experience here this morning as we have directed our thoughts, our prayers, the words of these songs. We have prayed them to you as we have sung them from our hearts. We've experienced you in worship. And Lord, help us today to understand the Lord's Supper. Challenge us right where we're living. Call us to yourself. And may this morning service be a transformation that leads to transformation through the Lord's Supper tonight. Lord, forgive me of my sins and forgive the sin of all those who are asking that from their heart on their lips this morning. And Lord, renew our relationship with you. Lord, bless us with an intensity and an intimacy in our walk with you. May we be transformed, changed into what you intended for us to be, doing what you saved us to do. That, Lord, we could do what we do not because it's part of the ritual, but that everything we do would be in worship of the holy God who loved us so much that he died for our sins. Lord, save anyone here who's not saved. Even if they're a member of this church or another church and have been baptized, but they're unsaved, Lord, call them to yourself right now. And Lord, if there's any of us who are living for ourselves, who have been saved, but we're living for ourselves rather than for Christ, call us back to you. Change us, change our homes, change our church, thus changing our community and our country, and thus changing the world. Bless the hurting today, the bereaved, the sick, those recovering from surgery. Bless Brother Adam. Bless all of those, Lord, recovering today. And Lord, we pray, Father, for our president and our leaders, our soldiers, first responders. Lord, just have your way and our disaster relief workers up and down the East Coast, but especially those in the Bahamas. Bless those dear people. Lord, probably going to be thousands whose lives were lost. Would you give those Christian disaster relief workers opportunity after opportunity to share Jesus with those who remain? It's in the powerful name of Jesus we pray that you would speak to us and help us to respond in faith to what your word says. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. One thing that Jesus told his disciples, and therefore he's telling all of us that we should do, is the Lord's Supper. Look at Luke 22, verse 19. And he took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. And then would you read that with me? Do this in remembrance of me. I may have shared with you before because it impacted me so greatly an experience that I had while en route to the Southern Baptist Convention one year. Had to stop and spend the night along the way and... Uh, had the opportunity to stop in Louisville, Kentucky, where I uh, was able to go to seminary, and woke up the next morning on that Sunday morning and went to the church worship service in a different faith tradition, a large mega church. And it was their custom and tradition to take the Lord's Supper every week. At the beginning of the service, right after the announcement, they passed out the cup and the bread simultaneously 
to several thousand people and within a couple of minutes it was over and it was done. Now it seemed to me as a one-time participant in that that it had just become another tradition that they went through every week. But that's not what it's intended to be. Thus the overarching truth is this. It's a time to remember. Jesus said, do it to remember what he did for us. It's a time to remember what he did for us. And if we do it properly, and if we get it right, we can begin to see and we can begin to sense what I want to preach about this morning. On this next slide, the transformative opportunity of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. That 28th verse is where we'll jump off from. Today in this text, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight, And if you would, read this verse with me. On the next slide, there we go. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. As we consider the Lord's Supper in the sermon this morning, I want us to look briefly at what it is and how it's to be observed, but I want to emphasize the opportunity that the Lord's Supper is for spiritual transformation in our lives when it is done properly. So how do we get it right? Well, here's the question we hope to answer this morning. What's necessary for us to receive the Lord's Supper properly? What's necessary for us to receive the Lord's Supper properly? Well, first of all, I believe the Word of God teaches us that it is necessary for us to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross before we can receive the Lord's Supper properly. Look at Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, that suffering servant passage. Have you ever just thought about the words here? But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds... We are healed. Just think about the, the, I mean, I'm not even sure that we would be allowed to, to show this in cartoons anymore or on uh, certain conversations with certain people. Pierced, crushed, punishment, wounds, the violence that was done to our Lord Jesus because he loved us so much that he took our place on the cross. We are to remember First of all, that his body was broken for us. Like the Passover lamb, Jesus, the lamb of God. He laid down his life as a sacrifice for sin. His body was broken. His hands and his feet, his side and his brow were pierced for us. And each time we take the bread and the cup in the Lord's Supper, we're reminded of the theological truth of the substitutionary atonement. Jesus gave his life for us. He laid his life down on the cross to pay the price for our sins. He died in our place. We can only properly receive the bread when we remember the broken body of our Lord. So we're to remember that his body was broken for us. And we're also to remember that his blood was shed for us. When Moses ratified the covenant that God made with Israel... He took the blood of the sacrifice and he sprinkled uh, half of it on the altar and the other half he sprinkled on the people and it was with the blood of the sacrifice that the covenant was sealed between God and his people. The old covenant was one, of course, which was based on the blood of sheep and oxen whereby the high priest would have to go into the Holy of Holies once a year and make atonement for the sins of the people. But when Jesus died, he fulfilled that law. He instituted a new covenant, one which was ratified or established on the strength of his shed blood. And this is why the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. His blood, his blood shed on the cross that should have been our cross poured out for the forgiveness of sins with his blood. 
with his blood, Sister Martha. He became the sacrifice for our sins, a sacrifice which was acceptable to God. And when we take the cup, we are remembering his shed blood. We are reflecting on the sacrifice that he made for us. That's what we're doing. He made that for us and we're being reminded of the covenant between us and God. A covenant sealed with the blood of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And being reminded of that covenant, When we receive the cup, being reminded of that covenant should have a sobering effect on our lives. We can only properly receive the Lord's Supper when we remember the shed blood of our Savior and when we remember His broken body. But also we are to remember that He's coming again someday soon. Someday soon He's coming again. Look at the 26th verse of that 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. How long until He comes? The Lord's Supper reminds us not only that Jesus died for us, but that He will come again for us someday soon. It calls us to live each day of our life in light of that final day and remembering what Jesus did for us on the cross should transform us. We can only properly receive the bread when we remember the broken body of the Lord. We can only properly receive the cup when we remember the shed blood of our Savior. And we can only properly live out our Christian faith when we remember that Jesus is coming back for us some sweet day. My challenge is whether we believe any of this or not. Do we really believe it? How many in the church today are truly saved? I don't know about you. I know about me. But between you and the Lord, have you truly been saved? When when you think about the broken body of Jesus, do you really believe that? Does that change who you are as a person in this world? When you think about the shed blood of Jesus, does that change the way that you live and make decisions every day in life? When you think about Him coming again at 6 o'clock tonight, do you really believe He's coming back again? Would you rather be on some hiking trail when Jesus comes back or here honoring Him and remembering what He's done for you? Does it change who you are? We can only properly receive the Lord's Supper when we remember his broken body, his shed blood, and that he's coming back for his church some sweet day. Yes, it is necessary. It is necessary for us to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross before we can receive the Lord's Supper properly. But also this morning, remembering what Jesus did for us on the cross does call us to action. Look on this next slide at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, the next two slides. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed. Redeemed from what? From the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. But yet many who say that Jesus has saved them, many whose names are on the rolls of this church and many other churches are still living their life according to the vain traditions handed down from their forefathers. The Lord's Supper calls us to specific action to bring the people this ordinance to become the people and be the people that this ordinance signifies or symbolizes that we are in Christ. The Lord's Supper does what? It calls us to be in right fellowship as members of the body of Christ. The Lord's Supper calls us to remember what it is that Jesus did for us and why it was necessary for Him to die for us. Each time we take the Lord's Supper, yes, we are to remember whose we are and the price that He paid to redeem us from the penalty of our sin. 
It should call us back to the cross. The bread and the cup call us to remember. The Lord's Supper also calls us to repent. Not just to remember, but to repent. When we take the cup and bread and remember all that the Lord Jesus has done for us and allow His Spirit, allow His Spirit to show us the things in our life which are inconsistent with our identities as Christians in this world. When we allow the Holy Spirit to show us all the things in our life that are inconsistent with our identity, As Christians, we should repent. If we're truly saved, it should break our heart and we should repent. That is, we should stop doing what is displeasing to God and begin to do what is pleasing in His sight. And this was why God had judged some of the believers at Corinth. When you study this 11th chapter of the 1st Corinthian correspondence from the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth, you'll find out that God brought judgment on that church. They were taking the cup and they were eating the bread in an unworthy manner. They were not judging themselves, therefore God says He was judging them. Look at the 27th verse. Therefore, because of this, Whoever eats the bread or whoever drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. So the Lord's Supper calls us to repent. What? I'm the, I don't drink. I, I don't uh, commit adultery. I don't do any of those things. Listen to what the Word of God says. The Lord's Supper calls us to repent of the attitudes of our hearts. The Lord's Supper calls us to repent of the actions of our hands which are displeasing to God. But there's also a second thing that these these ordinances call us to do. The Lord's Supper calls us to reconcile. This was the big problem in the Corinthian church. They had all the outward appearance of being Christians, but their fellowship was lacking love. It's passages like this which shed light, Brother Philip, on how seriously we are to take God's Word and how serious God is about our hearts being right with Him above all else. It really doesn't matter if you see this paint on this beautiful worship center as being purple or pink or off-white. It really doesn't matter if this carpet is your color or not. It really doesn't matter if you'd prefer to have theater chairs in here and a rock band. It really doesn't matter. None of that really matters to God. What really matters to God is how seriously we are taking God's Word and how serious God is about our hearts being right with Him above all else. One of the great problems in the lives of Christians like me and you today is that they have somehow, we have perhaps become so somehow, how do you do this, so desensitized to the Holy Spirit of God that they can go through the motions of church week after week. They can take the Lord's Supper time after time And never ever do we come to terms with the truth that our relationship with God is always and ever connected to their relationship with one another. We can't love God whom we've not seen if we can't love one another who we have seen. Finally, The Lord's Supper calls us to recommit our lives to Christ. So it's not just understanding these things. Brother Johnny, having an understanding of the Word of God is a wonderful thing. Being able to go to Bible study class and discuss the Word of God and and play one-upmanship in the circle, 
or the rows or however your class is set up. And, and you know, I, well, you, you know that. Well, yeah, that's the way I understand it too, except I've got a deeper inside. And, and just let me tell you about what the Lord has shown me in my prayer closet where I get up at 4 o'clock every morning and said, and God tells me to do it privately, but here I just can't help myself. I'm announcing it in Bible study class. The Lord's Supper calls us to do something with the Word of God that we know. It calls us to recommit our lives to Jesus Christ after reflecting on the authenticity of our walk with God and after remembering what it is that Jesus has done for us on the cross of Calvary, after remembering whose we are and who we are in Jesus, and after having the opportunity to repent of our sins and reconcile with one another, each time we take the Lord's Supper, we are called to recommit ourselves once again to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and to allow Him, the Holy Spirit, to have absolute unreserved control of our lives. So He calls us to surrender to His Lordship. It's not a play game. It's not something you do once in a while and feel good about so you can go out to the local uh, restaurant and have a good Sunday dinner. It, it's something he's called us to do to change us. That he is absolute Lord boss of our life. He's the commanding general. We're in his army and we are to say, yes, sir, God, whatever you want me to do, whether I like it or not, whether I'm comfortable or not, whether I'm good at it or not, if you have called me to do it, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability with the indwelling Holy Spirit's help. Yes, I'm going to stay on this job if that's what you want me to do, Lord. I'm going to take a new job if that's what you want me to do, Lord. I'm going to suffer things for you if that's what you want me to do. I'm going to become a missionary if that's what you want me to do. I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. You're the boss, Lord. You're the boss. So in review, we ask again, look at this slide, what's necessary for us to receive the Lord's Supper properly? Well, first of all, to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross and receive the Lord's Supper properly. And then secondly, remembering what Jesus did for us on the cross calls us to action. And so what action has he called you to do this morning? Is, has he spoken to you about the condition of your heart? Are you saved by the blood of the Lamb? How are you washed? Could you sing that song and really mean I, I am washed in the blood of the Lamb? I'm saved by His grace. I was nothing and I am nothing except a child, a sinner, saved by His grace. What's the condition of your heart? Has he spoken to you about the condition of your heart? And if you know you're saved, has he spoken to you this morning about something in your life which you need to get right? Something that you need to get right. You're being a detriment to other people. You're not serving the Lord the way you ought to because they see you and see a Christian and if they see a mad temper tantrum out of you because they, they won't honor your discount of 25% off and you're a day late trying to use it and you throw a temper tantrum and say, well, that's stupid to th put that in such small print that I couldn't read it without my binoculars. If that's what Jesus is, they won't know part of Jesus. Is there something in your life that you need to do something about, you need to get right? Is there someone with whom you need to reconcile? Is there a day today that you need to recommit your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We've emphasized the opportunity of the Lord's Supper. It's for spiritual transformation when done properly. But I believe God may be calling some folks to that transformation this morning. We've answered the question of what's necessary. We've answered that. What's necessary for us to receive it? We've answered that question but there's one question that remains and it's just for you. Will you do it? Will you do what is necessary?
to receive the Lord's Supper properly? Will you truly worship God? In Leadership Journal, sometime back, Timothy J. Christensen wrote this one compelling statement. He said, if worship is just one thing we do in life, everything becomes mundane. But if worship is the one thing we do with our life, everything takes on eternal significance. Would you pray with me as you consider exactly how God would have you to respond to this word? Is, there, is your heart saved? Are you ready to go? Are you one with Jesus? Is there something in your life that needs to be changed? Do you need to surrender your life and your will to the will of God and make Him the Lord, the King, the Sovereign, the controller of your life. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today. And Lord, we know that sometimes the Lord's Supper just is another thing we do. The Lord help us not to worry any less about the Lord's Supper than we do about seeing people saved and baptized. Because it's so significant that we remember what Jesus did for us, how he took our place on the cross, how that he paid for our sins, how that, Lord, he gave us the gift of faith so that we could be saved. And, Lord, it reminds us that, Lord, we are to be in fellowship with you, in fellowship with your bride, the church, in fellowship with one another as believers. Lord, let us be reconciled. And Lord, not only reconciled in Christ, but reconciled to each other. And then Lord, finally, Lord, if something's in our life that needs to go, Lord, would you just spiritually remove it from us today as we surrender our life in the Lordship of Jesus Christ that we could be a representative of who Jesus is and his saving knowledge. That it's not just a show that it's not just a performance, but Lord, that it is a lifestyle that's conveying a message that I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And that my soul that once was dirty with sin and black, Lord, from lostness, is saved in the light of the precious gospel as Jesus told it in his life. Lord, change us. Lord, let us know that we're saved. And then, Lord, let us live like we're saved for all of our days. Have your way this morning. Tenderize our hearts. Remove the pride of life from our mind and our lips and call us back to you so that we can, back, can come back tonight and properly worship you as we remember the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ and that he's coming back for us very, very soon. Even so, come quickly. Lord Jesus, and all of God's people said, Amen. Would you please stand with me? And as you have heard the Lord speak to you through His Word this morning, would there be a call of God in your life to be saved? Would there be a call of God in your life for something that needs to be removed, that's displeasing to God? Would there be a call of God in your life to do something that is pleasing to God? Would there be a call in your life to be reconciled to someone that you need to be reconciled with? Would there be a call in your life to live every day like you know Jesus is coming back again really soon?
an urgency to reaching people with the good news, the gospel as Jesus told it. The gospel as Jesus told it is a lot different than the gospel we're living out in our life in 2019 in the United States of America. The gospel as Jesus told it. Are you willing to surrender to his lordship in your life? While we sing, would you come? Would you pray? Would you give the glory to Jesus? Don't wait. If he's spoken to you, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of repentance. Today is the day to make him the Lord of your life. No one can do this but you. Only you. While we sing, this is not just something that we do at the end of the service. The invitation is genuine, it's from the Lord, and it's to you and me. Is he inviting you? Then come to him this morning. Brother Allen, would you lead us as we sing? Amen. I love you. I'll prove it anytime you'll let me. Jesus loves you even more. He's already proved it. Surrender. 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 6, 6 p.m. tonight. Lord's Supper. Hope to see you here. Brother Dale, would you ask our benediction before we sing our hymn of fellowship? Shelter, my bed.